Okay. Oh, when the Savior call, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. Oh, when the Savior call, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. And if my heart is right when he calls me, if my heart is right, I will hear. Oh, when my heart is right, when he calls me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Amen. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen. amen. All right. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, it is a blessing for us to be here today, tonight, this evening. Uh, I think sometimes we take uh, the mundane, the mundane things of life for granted. Sometimes I, uh, I, I, as I get older, I learn to appreciate every moment because life is made up of moments. We always looking for this epic event, but it's really made up of moments. And it's those moments that you really learn to appreciate. And, uh, and I have a way of, when I got up this morning, I, I realized that immediately when I stepped, put my foot on the ground, I was walking on grace and mercy. And I, and I, I read in my daily devotion where his mercies are new every morning. I don't have no layover mercies. I don't have none stored up in the refrigerator anywhere. They're new every morning. And because they're new every morning, I know that my Redeemer lives. So as we sing, I know that my Redeemer lives, I want you to sing it with, as if it's gonna be the last time you're gonna ever sing this song. All right, amen? All right. I know that my Redeemer can never pray for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know the eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He will that I should holy in word and thought in Eternal life begins. I know 
Father, we approach your throne of grace and mercy, so thankful for this opportunity to come sing songs of praise and worship and adoration to your name. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy that has allowed us to reassemble. We thank you for all those that work together to bring about this great week. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to assemble from night to night and those that were able to be here in the daytime. We ask that you bless the speakers that have spoken and thank you for their efforts and their work. We ask you bless those that were the recipients of their messages, that they might be able to store those messages from your word up in their heart and in their minds, apply them to their lives, and make them to be better people in the future than they have been in the past. We pray that you bless the speakers of tonight, bless both of the men that have been chosen to serve you in sharing the gospel and sharing the word of God with us. Give them a good recollection of the things that they have prepared that they might be able to give them to us in a plain and simple and understandable way. Help us to be honest hearers of your word, to examine ourselves and to compare ourselves to the word of God to make the changes that are necessary in our lives. We acknowledge our faults and our sins. We confess. We ask that you forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us of our wrongs and our shortcomings and help us to be Uh, more pleasing to you that we'd grieve the Holy Spirit less that we would please you more and more and honor Christ more each day we ask your blessings upon this congregation and all those that are assembled or those that are represented by those that are assembled here tonight may we take back the word that we we will hear and share it with others and help us to find those outside of the body of Christ that need to hear the message that we'll hear tonight and share the gospel of salvation with them as well We thank you, Father, for all of your blessings, but most of all, we thank you for your Son who died in our place. We pray that when this life is over, we'd stand before you redeemed and justified by the blood of the Lamb. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good evening, Eastside. We are back here at the Texas State Lectureship Impact Conference on a Wednesday night. And I started out Saturday night. And I've been intoxicated ever since Saturday night. We showed up and we had a singing here Saturday night. I got in my car and drove home. And I was driving while intoxicated. I was intoxicated by the spirit and not the spirits. There's a difference. So I went home and the after party started. I went home and turned on YouTube and watched the whole concert again. And and I came in here on Sunday morning intoxicated. And I heard brother W. L. Ross and brother GMW2 on Sunday and I come in here tonight and I can't wait because I've been intoxicated all week so tonight we have two great speakers tonight and someone has already been looking for our first speaker he comes by the way of brother Amram Joyner from the great city of Wharton, Texas This front row is represented by Wharton, Texas. We have another brother here. 
he preaches at the MLK Street Church of Christ in Wharton. And Brother Amram Jorner serves as the minister of the Martin Luther King Church. He holds a bachelor's degree in religious education from Southwestern Christian College. He also holds two master's degrees, two master's degrees, one in theology and the other in biblical languages. He also serves as a licensed administrator at Just Enough Emergency Shelter for Boys, a young man. You know, we've been, we've seen rather that God will provide. Didn't he provide for Abraham? A ram in a bush and tonight he has provided Amram tonight so God is still working for us so we'll have a song and the next voice you will hear is brother Amram Jorner from Wharton Texas Martin Luther King Church of Christ I had a spy all week telling me what was going to be sung, and so I won't repeat, but I couldn't help it to repeat this song because I just love it. Right. It's called My God is Awesome, right? Yeah. Our God is Awesome. Yeah. I first said it was my God, right? Yeah. But it's our God is Awesome. So I want you to help me sing it. I want you to stand, and I want you to sing it boldly. Our God is Awesome, right? My God is awesome, He can move mountains, He keep me in the valley, hide me from the rain. Oh, my God is awesome, He heals me when I'm broken, sick when I am weakened, forever He will reign. Oh, my God is awesome. Let us all say amen. amen. Truly, it's a blessing to be in the house of God to worship and to praise his name. For God is spirit, and they that worship him must do it in spirit and in truth. How y'all feeling on tonight? I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. Brother George Williams Sr., I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. I bring you greetings from the MLK Church of Christ in Wharton. Texas. Now, my subject uh, is a very interesting subject. Defending God in light of evil. Defending God in light of 
evil. From the book of Job, Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. Now that's a very, very interesting subject. So I had to really, really dig to put it together. But I do believe I put it together. All right? All right. So, um, so uh, Job chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, Job chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 20 and 21. Job chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. And he said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Defending God in light of evil. Defending God in light of evil. Now let me uh, tell a story. And then I'm going to pass over the text three or four times. And then this message will be yours. The Bible says there is a man in the land of Oz whose name is Job. The Bible says that he is a good man. He is a man who worships God. He is a man who has a strong love for God. But one day, the God who he loves decides to change his life forever. God approaches Satan and asks him a very pivotal question. Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him in all the land. So the devil says the reason why Job serves you is because you put a hedge around him. But if I can remove the hedge, I guarantee you, he will curse you to your face. Well, God says, okay, just don't take his life. Job loses all of his kids. Job loses all of his livestock in a matter of moments. The Holy Spirit says, while he yet spake, while he yet spake, while he yet spake, all of this is designed to break Job. But Job remains. Chapter 2. God again says to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? As if though chapter 1 was not enough. There's none like him in all the land. God, if you let me touch his health, he's going to curse you to your face. God says, go. So the Bible says, Job was a sick man. His breath is so horrible. He drove men or drives men far from his presence. Then in chapter 3, through chapter 37, you have three cycles here. Each one of Job's friends spoke three times. And then in chapter 38, the Almighty shows up. So chapter 38 through 42, God is on the scene. Now let me watch this. Now, let's, now, now, let, that's, now we going to school. Y'all ready to go to school? Yeah. All right. All right. There was a man in the land of Oz by the name of Job. Ish Hayi Baeris Eov. What are you doing, preacher? I'm, I'm, y'all, y'all stay with me. See, in English, in English, the subject precedes the verb. All right. In Hebrew, the verb precedes the subject. All right. But in this text, we got a problem because the subject comes before the verb. Yeah, yeah. That means the subject is emphatic. What's emphatic? Job, from the onset, God is making it clear that this man here it's going to stand the test. So right when you look at the Hebrew text, it jumps out at you. Oh, this is emphatic. This is emphatic. The devil got a problem. Now watch this. 
so brother Williams it's emphatic yes, sir. so God placed an emphasis on Job in first Peter chapter 1 verse 7 when Peter says the genuineness of your faith that's called the attributed genitive what does that mean Peter is not saying to the his recipients that God is exposing your faith to bring out all the impurities that's not what he's saying He's saying, your faith is so genuine, but nobody knows about it. So I'm going to cause trouble in your life to expose this great. Y'all going to help me along here? Back to Job. Job has this genuine faith, but nobody knows. Why do you think we're feasting now? Because of the life Job lived. Because of the things he went through. So, 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 so God says, I got a servant whose name is Job. Yeah. And I'm going to put him on display. Why? Because I'm going to expose this great faith. I'm talking to somebody tonight. Yeah. So you say, you say, preacher, I'm going through it. Have you ever thought? It's not because God trying to draw the impurities, but he's trying to expose this hidden faith that nobody knows. Watch this. Then arose Job, Satan and God are going back and forth. Everybody waiting to see what Job is going to do. Yeah, God is watching. Satan is watching. And here Job is on the scene. The Bible says that Job got up and then he fell back down. Now he didn't fall back down in the seat that he was sitting in. Because had he did that, he wouldn't have been low enough. Y'all missed that. You missed it. When he got up, the Bible says he fell back down. But he didn't fall back down in his chair. He fell to the ground to worship. See, had he fell back in the chair, he would have, been, he would have not been low enough. See, the reason why some of us have not worked through our situation and worshiping in spite of what's happening to us is because we fell back down into the chair. Yeah. You're not low enough. Low, 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 low. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Job going to do? Have you considered my servant? Satan got a problem. Now one thing about wisdom literature, that's Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalms, Job. Job. You got to interpret them in light of one another. Yeah. Okay, so in Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walking out of the country ungodly. He shall be planted by the rivers of water. The devil does not understand that God has been watering. See, the God says, you can try him. I watered him myself and I guarantee you can't pluck him. He's planted by the waters of God and as a result, Satan cannot Oh, y'all gonna, 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 gonna work with me? He's been planned by God. So Satan try. I could speak for that servant. I'm gonna let you push him to the limit. But I've planted him so deep, he gonna be all right. 
Huh. Now watch this, watch this. Watch this. Have you considered my servant, Job? There's none like him in all the land. Job loses everything. Watch this. Solomon had it all. Yeah. Remember, wisdom literature interprets one another. Solomon walked away from God for a while to see what it was that made men happy. He tried wine, he tried wisdom, he tried women, and he tried wealth. At the end of the book, he said, here is the conclusion. Watch, listen, here's the shout. Solomon had it all and walked away. Job lost it all but stayed. Did you hear what I said? Have you considered? He's different. Proverbs 1 says, the fear of the Lord. See, in Proverbs, when the writer's talking about, t -t 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 wisdom is talking to this young man, telling him what to do and what not to do, that's a script. That's a script. When we read the book of Job, we get the motion picture as to what that looks like in real time. Yeah, yeah. So God has a script for us in Proverbs. But then in Job, he shows us the movie. I'm going to show you what this looks like in real life and in real time. Job says, I'm going to stay. Though I'm losing everything I got, I'm a whole what I got. Am I talking to somebody tonight? Huh? And watch, watch. In chapter 38, God shows up. God shows up. Listen, and he counsels Job, and Job puts his hand over his. Wisdom does not counsel happiness. Wisdom counsels those who fear the Lord. See, in chapter 1 and 2, Job was in middle school. In chapters 3 through 37, he's in college. But by the time you get to chapter 38, he's in graduate school. We got some folk in here tonight who's in middle school. Y'all get the metaphor? Yes, sir. We got some folk in here tonight yeah. who's in college uh -huh. and you stuck there and God says it's time to graduate. Yes, See, he used Job but he fixed him in the process. Now I'm about to take, I don't preach long, y'all. I don't preach long. I say what I got to say and sit down. All right, that's just, that's how I do it. Now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. You know what a preacher is in the book of Job? Let me show, I'm going to prove it to you. You know what a preacher is in the book of Job? It's not the fact that his daughters are much beautiful. It's not the fact that God blessed them with all that stuff he lost over, or rather even more. That's not to preach. He says in 42.5, I heard of you, but now I see you. That's what a preacher is. When, when, when I, everything God gave, he could have took again, but not the encounter. My Lord, yes sir. He could do nothing with the encounter. 
See, when God had him at the bottom, Psalms chapter 40, verse 6, God was digging out his ears. Wisdom literature, interpreting one another. When God had him at the bottom, God was digging out his ears. When God shows up in a whirlwind and challenges him, God is digging out his ears. So now Job can hear and now he can see better. You got an earache tonight? God may be. Now watch this. How does this tie into defending God in light of evil? God going to put his servant on display, allow evil to attack his servant, and that servant still turn around and says, I'm going to worship God. Yeah. Yeah. That's our God. So Job is God's defense when it comes to evil. With, with, no matter what happens in life, we can be like Job. Yeah. And say, I'm going to fall, not back in the chair, mm -hmm. but I'm going to fall all the way. Because if I'm in the chair, I'm still too high. I got to go down and worship God and allow God to do what God knows to do best. It's a song. Uh, it's a song. Do I need to have, just sit down? Okay. <laughs> do I sit down? Or <laughs> God bless you. Oh. All right, let me make a note here. Uh, Texas State Lectureship 2024, Tyler, Texas. Invite Amram Joyner. <laughs> Preaching from Job 1, 2, and 3. We just appreciate you, brother. And no doubt now, I will not get over my intoxication. I'll be driving home tonight because you fill the cup once again. So we appreciate what you had to say. We really do. Appreciate you taking time. Uh, we have a small uh, token of appreciation by way of a certificate, Brother Joyner. If you don't mind, if you would come up, I would like to present you with this certificate of appreciation. So put your hands together once again for Brother Joyner. Next on the agenda, we have a brother that will be preaching from Jeremiah 29, 1 through 11. Keep hope alive. By the way, our brother Randall Tucker, he's no stranger here. He came and did a gospel meeting a couple years ago and just tore the church up the way we like to be torn up. And we didn't forget about Brother Tucker. He had an H-Town takeover because he's from Houston. So Brother Tucker, by the way, Randall F. Tucker Sr., he's the minister of the South Union Church of Christ in Houston, Texas. Get this now, he was baptized at an early age, 10 years old. He has been active in the Lord's Church since his childhood years. Brother Randall is an alumnus of both Tennessee State University as well as the Nashville School of Preaching. Having been exposed to public speaking at an early age, Minister Tucker has been blessed, has been blessed, recognized throughout the nation as a prolific and powerful seminar specialist. And in 2017, he was a recipient of the Prolific Preachers Award of Houston, Texas. In 20 years of public ministry, God has blessed him to lead congregations in both Tennessee and Texas, TU and UT. Through God's grace, he has proclaimed the gospel on city, state, regional, and national lectureships. Minister Tucker has also been a speaker on the National Crusades for Christ and serves on the several boards of leadership throughout the state of Texas. So the next voice you will hear, as Brother Williams always says, and I think he should coin this phrase, and unless Jesus comes, will be Brother Randall Tucker after the song. Amen. 
I love to praise Him. 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 I love to praise His holy name. I love to praise Him. 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 Oh, His soul. Oh, now He's my rock, my rock. Oh, and He's the wind. You know in the middle Oh, I know he'll never Never, never let me down He's just a jewel Oh, I'm singing hallelujah Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. How blessed we are to assemble here at this time for another expression of God's goodness and his eternal grace in that he has touched us with the finger of his dear love and allowed us to open our eyes that we might see the bright light and the beautiful scenery of a brand new day. We have a reason, family, to be excited because anytime God says yes, it has really been a very good day. And God has smiled on this 47th Texas State Lectureship. And I think that God is worthy of all of our praise. I want to take a moment and first of all, uh, just say thank you to Minister Amram Joyner, my colleague and covenant brother, for doing a fabulous job as always uh, he is somebody's preacher and I enjoy learning from him each and every time he mounts the sacred desk and then something needs to be said about this church uh, the mighty east side church of Christ amen somebody can we give God some glory for east side amen amen it is just a phenomenal experience each and every time uh, that we receive an invitation to be here at Eastside. Eastside is one of God's flagship congregations throughout all of the brotherhood. Uh, no matter where you go, no matter how far you travel, someone knows something great and good about the saints here at Eastside, Austin, Texas. And I just believe that whenever God is pleased with his people, he always provides a righteous leader to lead the way. Amen. Uh, your leader says something about what God thinks about you. Because the righteous rejoice when the righteous are in power. In a position of authority and scriptural oversight. And so I want to take a moment and salute Dr. George M. Williams Sr. Uh, because he is a bright light in our brotherhood. Amen. He's a bright light in our brotherhood. He has done so much to encourage so many. And uh, not only is he loved here in Eastside, we love him in Houston. 
Amen. We love him in Houston, all over, in the city, as well as at South Union. And he's done great work for us at South Union. And we thank God for uh, this, this opportunity. I want to also thank our illustrious MC on tonight uh, for keeping us on time and on schedule and uh, we appreciate him and our song leader on tonight we appreciate his giftedness as well want to take a moment and also salute the leadership here at east side things don't just happen uh, people come together amen Amen. People come together so that God is glorified and uh, all of the elders here, I know most of them, if not all of them, uh, if you would please stand, all of the elders and deacons as well, if you would please stand. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. Look, look at this dream team. Amen. Of leaders. You know, sometimes things look like a setback. But in actuality, they are a set up. And uh, this church had an unfortunate, some would say, experience with the inclement weather. But what looked like a setback, my, 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 it may have been a set up. And so we thank God. We thank God for the great things that he has done here. And uh, you just leave an indelible impression upon everyone in the brotherhood. Uh, now, I see many, many outstanding uh, preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I've looked up to for many, many years. They are here with us. All of the preachers that are in the house just stand so that we might give God glory. All of the preachers. All of the preachers. All of the preachers. Amen. Amen, someone. Amen. 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 Um, maybe I should not highlight anyone, but I have to say something about Dr. S.T.W. Gibbs III. Amen. Um, uh, Brother Gibbs inspired me while I was a younger man. And uh, I don't know if I would even be here today had he not given me that inspiration many, many years ago. And of course, it does not hurt that Mama Gibbs is here with him on tonight. And there is a Tennessee connection in the house. Amen, somebody. And we're just happy and excited to see them. There are those with us tonight from South Union. South Union, if you're in the house, just stand. I know I see Pop and Mother Holland are here. Mother Blair is here. Amen. Amen. And we're, we're grateful for their encouragement and their support. Uh, they uh, don't mind hearing their preacher one more time. <laughs> and they have to endure me every Sunday. So I, I really appreciate them. And to many more who are watching online, uh, to my great parents, Jesse and Carolyn Tucker, my sister Susan, my beautiful wife, Erica, and our children, my mother-in-law, father-in-law, and all of the saints uh, back in H-Town. We thank God for your online presence. Now, how many people came to hear word from the Lord? Amen. I don't believe that we've come out today and that you've driven from all points of your beginning uh, of your trip uh, to sit here and to just hear what we have to say. Uh, I believe that someone needs to see Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, if you would please open up your Bible uh, to the book of Jeremiah. The chapter is 29 and the verses are 1 through 11. Uh, grateful that God has <clears throat> touched me uh, because as we started out this week, I could not speak above a whisper. And uh, God has uh, allowed me to uh, have some tone of voice. And I thank God. Now, it may leave again before the end of this message, just depending on how hard y'all make me work up here. <laughs> but I'm grateful, uh, grateful to be here on tonight. There's one verse that we want to highlight uh, in your hearing. Uh, Jeremiah 29, verse number 11, there is a word. It reads from the King James Version, thusly, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. The English Standard Version reads this way, For I know the plans 
I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. It reads this way from the Amplified Version. For I know the plans and thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Our assigned text and topic on tonight is simply keep hope alive. Amen, somebody. Say it with me. Keep hope alive. There was a young boy who was in the first grade, and this young boy who was in the first grade was not doing very well in school. And so after weeks of continuous observation, uh, his mother decided that she would intervene and that she would uh, give him a pep talk uh, to encourage him to raise his grades. And of course, she did just that. And as she encouraged him, they were walking one day in the mall. And he saw a toy truck in the window. And he said, Mama, can I have that toy truck? And his mother said, Well, son, I want you to be focused in school. I want you to listen to your teacher. I want you to stay in your seat and complete each class. I want you to raise your grades because you're smart enough. Uh, you have the ability and you just need to apply yourself. And if you raise your grades, then I will, in fact, purchase that truck and it will be just for you. Weeks went by and the teacher saw that this young boy had made a change. He had turned a 180 in the development of his academic course and studies. And his grades began to climb. He started turning in his homework. He started studying more for his quizzes and tests. And he began to pass the class. So much so that the teacher brought him to the side one day and said, Son, I noticed a change in you. You started out the semester very low. Uh, very uh, much uh, discouraged. But she said, I see that there's something different in your eye right now. It seems that you've turned a corner and that you've matured. You've, growing, you've grown up and now you are interested in class. I would like to know what made the difference for you. And the little boy, without hesitation, looked at the teacher and said, Teacher, it is simply because my mother said she believed in me. And my mother promised me that if I raised my grades, that she would get me that toy truck that I saw in the window at the mall. Come here for a moment, family. His mother gave him hope. And if we ever needed hope, in a time in our lives, we need hope in the world today. We are God's children. We are the called, but we have lost hope along the way. I'm glad that we in the church can keep hope alive. Here it is, family. Someone says, what is hope? Hope is vitally important to the quality of our upward climb. Hope is defined as the confident expectation and or anticipation that is rooted in the belief of the fulfillment of something that is desired. Hope is a defining characteristic and attribute of the Christian. Due to the finite structure, family, of humanity, man must absolutely depend on God to heal all of his hurts, to ease his pain, to provide deliverance, and ultimately the reward of eternal salvation because we are all finite creatures. The future for finite creatures is always uncertain and unknown. And this is why we have to depend on an almighty, all-knowing, ever-present God to reveal unto us what's going to happen on the morrow. The text right here before us is absolutely a text that
that reaches for hope that we might appreciate the intrinsic value of this text I believe that it is necessary family for us to go to Bible class before we make it to church this evening the contextual situation and setting of our text before us features the prophet Jeremiah in the seventh century this prophet to Judah whose name means God exalts Jeremiah was born around the year of 657 BC during the reign of wicked King Manasseh in the village of Ananoth about three miles northeast of Jerusalem this is also the span of time that the great Asherah uh, shook up the culture by sacking the ancient Egyptian city of Thebes according to ancient world history and ruled the Assyrian Empire Jeremiah's father's name was Hilkiah and he belonged to the tribe of Benjamin Jeremiah's call took place in the 13th year of King Josiah's reign. It was God family that informed Jeremiah that he had co consecrated and appointed him even before his physical existence in the world. You remember Jeremiah 1 beginning at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee and before you came out of the womb I saw sanctified thee and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations then said I O Lord behold I cannot speak for I am a child thou shalt go to all that I send thee and say not that I am a child whatsoever I command you you shall speak be not afraid watch it now of their faces why for I am with you to deliver you saith the Lord. Jeremiah's ministry family extended for more than 40 years, encompassing much of the reigns of at least five kings of Judah. He was a contemporary family of the prophets of Zephaniah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and even Ezekiel. Beloved, I see at least several different letters that are involved in this 29th chapter of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is first of all writing to the exiles in Babylon who have been taken away in Babylon captivity but he also takes time to encourage those who have held on to God to continue to here it is keep hope alive and then to those that had lost hope he's trying to rebuild their faith he's trying to encourage their soul and so he encourages them to hold on to God because God has not forgotten about them someone ought to ask me why was there a need to keep hope alive it's simply because Jerusalem and the saints that were there or the Jews that were there uh, were involved in a sinful past that shaped their present condition here it is family because of their sinful disobedient and arrogant ways because they involved themselves in idolatry God allowed them to be taken into captivity by the Babylonian Empire you'll notice in your text that each time the Bible speaks about their going in into Babylonian Empire in this particular pericope of Scripture that the Bible says and God caused them to go or God allowed them to go which signifies that had they stayed with the Lord and been obedient to what thus saith the Lord God would have never allowed the enemy to overtake them I think that's a good word of encouragement for us that even when we find ourselves in situations that are not possible positive th situations that we don't know how we're going to make it out of we need to look back over our lives and trust that the same God who allowed this to happen is the same God who will deliver us out of it all I thought that would be a good point here it is family he addresses three groups of people he addresses people who have no hope he addresses people who have put their faith in false hope and then he has encouraged those 
those to continue to keep hope alive. Now watch it. Those who have lost hope in verses 4 through 6. The exiles had lost everything but their lives. What few possessions they could carry with them into Babylon. They lost their freedom and they were now captives. They were now slaves. They had been taken away from their homes. They had been taken away from their families. They had been taken away from their livelihood and they had no means of creating wealth for their families. Many of them family were disconnected and even removed from family and friends. Their loved ones, some even perished in the deportation because they were in a situation that seemed desperate, helpless, and hopeless. Due to the harsh treatment uh, that they received from the Babylonian government, many Jews probably felt like, what's the use? We've been captured. We might as well give over. We might as well give in. And some even parenthetically may have said, it's time for us to do the Marvin Gaye. You know what that is. Make you want to holler and throw up both of your hands. And so Jeremiah said, no, it's time for you to understand that God is dealing with the sin problem. And he wanted them to know that God has brought you into this situation because of your own idolatry, because of your own uh, sinful ways, because of your own sinful lust, and because of your own sinful desires. But family, one of the first steps as we seek to heal from tragedy and turn tragedy into triumph is to learn to accept the situation that we are in. Don't accept it to the point where you become complacent, where you don't try to continue to trust God and pray and try to continue to see your way out of it but be uh, understanding enough to say you know the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away have the resolve to say blessed be the name of the Lord and so Jeremiah says I want you to know that you might be in prison but you don't have to live like a prisoner here it is family for every word of God is pure and he is a shield to them that put their trust in him the psalmist declares that God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Here it is. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. When you are a child of God, you have to have the resolve enough and the faith enough to say it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If we can just hold on, family, to the hope that lies within. But not only that, family, not only that, Jeremiah sees that there are some who have some false hope. In verses 7 through 9, there were false prophets among the people. And they had convinced some people that uh, the stay in Babylon will only be short. It will only be brief, perhaps two years, and then we're coming out of this. There was no need, they said, to lead a normal life or to settle down because they were going to be delivered in a short time span. However, they were lying to the people. Jeremiah Jeremiah gave them the true word of God and Jeremiah proclaims and even declares that you have been brought into this land and that you will be held captive for at least 70 years. Now check this out. 70 years is vitally important because it wasn't just that they would be held captive for 70 years but what he was really saying is that 70 years is about the expected lifespan of an individual and with reason of strength you live beyond that. He was saying that some of you are in captivity right now and you could even die in captivity but you need to have the resolve enough that even if you die in your captivity you'll never let go of your hope in God. And I thought that'd be a good word of encouragement for us even here on today because we have a lot of these false prophets that are running around here with blab it and grab it, name it and claim it and if you're 
you're not delivered from of it, it's because you lack faith. If you sow a seed and sow enough seed, then God is going to bring you out. But no family, you may not be healed of your disease. You may not ever make it out of poverty. You may not ever make it on the other side or move even up to the east side. But that does not mean that you give up on God because God knows how to deliver his own. Is there anybody here who has seen the lightning flash and you've heard the thunder roll? Is there anybody here that has gone through some adverse times? You've gone through some negative situations, but you still come out saying, I didn't lose my joy. I still have my joy. I still have my resolve. I still have my faith because I recognize that I serve a God who is worthy to be praised. Well, not only did he address those with false hopes, but the Bible says that some of those who were false prophets would even be roasted in the fire. I wish I had time to talk about Zedekiah and Shemaiah, but those that have read their Bible and those that are students of the Old Testament, you understand that God knows how to deal with someone who's lying on his name. And I thought that that would be good for us to remember that while we are on this upward climb, let's make sure that we stay with what thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah says, uh, according to the word of God, go ahead and have families. Go ahead, be fruitful and multiply. Go ahead and continue to worship God. Let me make that into contemporary language. Go ahead in this pandemic, come on back to church. Come on back to Bible study. Keep reading your Bible. Keep praying for one another. Keep loving one another. Keep forgiving one another. And anybody who tells you otherwise, is a false prophet and could be roasted in the fire of judgment. Oh family, I'm glad about it. I'm glad about it because not only were there those who had lost hope, not only were there those who had some false hope, but I praise God that there was a remnant of folk who still kept hope, who still kept hope alive. Are you with me in here? True hope family, here it is as I hasten toward my conclusion. True hope is based on the revealed word of God and not dream messages or self-appointed prophets. God gave his people gracious promise to deliver them and he said that he would keep his promise. Now watch it. He says if you keep reading your Bible you ought to be able to see this. Uh, he says I'm going to deliver you but you don't know when the deliverance is going to come so don't just pause and wait on me. Continue to be faithful and wait for me and as you wait for me faithfully I will bring deliverance right on time. Well, family, if you needed a, a better way to break it down in your mind, in the legal world, there is an, a, a, an idea and a concept called stare decisis. Here it is. It is a legal concept under the canopy of doctrine of presidents. Judicial judgments and decisions are reached after studying a pattern of similar cases and their subsequent rulings. Here it is, family. When going through difficult times, we can literally take the case study that God has provided us in the Bible and see how others made it over. Don't worry about if God has not delivered you yet. Just be faithful because the case study says that he comes through time after time after time. It was Noah who had to wait some 120 years for God to come through. It was Joseph that had to work for some 14 years for God to come through. I wish I had some Bible that read their Bible in here. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was God who, who blessed Joseph. It was God who blessed Noah. David was on the run for 10 years from Saul, but God still delivered David and David became the king of Israel. It doesn't matter matter how long you've been in your situation, don't you lose faith in God because our God can bring you out.
out. Well, now, when you study the cases, you'll go ahead and read Romans 8, 24 and 25. No wonder the apostolic writer Paul says, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth. Why does he hope for it? But the text says, but if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I need the church to say, keep hope alive. Uh, I say, keep hope alive. Saints, the scriptures reveal that to live without hope is to literally live without God in the world. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 12. Remember you that at this time you were separated from Christ and alienated from the common wealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. Here it is, having no hope and without God in the world. When you see Jeremiah 29 and verse number 11, we have something that is a figure called Hydeodus. Now Hydeodus is a figure where you take a complex term and you connect the two by a coordinating conjunction. So when Jeremiah says that God is going to give you a future he says and he's going to give you a hope that tells me that God knows what's going on in the portals of time that has been yet unseen by man and God knows how to deliver the righteous God knows how to give faith to the righteous God knows how to strengthen you when you are at your weakest point when you're down to your lowest moment this is why I want to encourage somebody today then hold on to God. I know it's been rough. I know you've had a rough year. I know you've lost some loved ones. I know you've buried some family members. I know you might be looking for a job. I know the children are almost getting on your nerves. I know the grandkids are calling you for money. I know that people have uh, borrowed money from you in the past and they still can't pay it back. But don't you worry about everybody and what they need. Just keep on holding on to the mighty hand of God because God is able to deliver you and he'll bring you deliverance right on time. Family, may I remind you as I close that we have a reason for hope because we can watch it now. There are some things in life that we can live without for any given time. We can live without water for a few days. We can live without food. We can live without love. We may not want to live without love, but you can make it even if you don't have love. But if you ever lose your hope, you are in a helpless situation. Hold on to your hope. Someone says, well preacher, why do I need to hold on to my hope? Because hope is the anchor for the soul. Here it is, God. Y'all don't mind if I celebrate the text for a moment, do you? I say God is the architect of hope. Let me give you some reasons why you want to hold on to your hope. God is the distributor of hope. God is the source of hope. God is the strength of hope. God is the sustainer of hope. God is uh, the, the, the very foundation of hope. Hope breeds confidence. Hope encourages you to see and expect when you don't know how you're going to make it out. Hope motivates the mind, it settles the spirit, and it soothes the soul. Hope can grow and develop. Hope can diminish and be lost. Hope says you can make it. Hope is attractive. Hope centers you and holds you up when other folk have let you down. Hope keeps you saying good morning, even when sometimes folk get on your nerves and you want to tell them goodbye. Are y'all following me? But not only that, hope is very important because when we keep our hope, we can make it another day. Reasons to keep hope alive. Here it is. I can keep hope alive because God has done some marvelous things in our lives. Is there anybody here who's thankful that God has brought them from a mighty long way? Watch it now. From dirt in the yard to a three-car garage. From cotton 
sacks uh, to Cadillacs, uh, from chitlins to caviar, from neck bones to T-bones. God has brought you a mighty, mighty long way. I want to encourage you to don't be discouraged. You have hope in God. There's hope in Christ. There's hope in the Holy Spirit. There's mercy when you find hope. His promises are sure in the word. He gives us hope and we have patience. He gives us hope and we have comfort. Hope can be described as good, as lively, as sure. It's steadfast. Hope enables you and having boldness in your preaching. Saints were called to hope. Saints rejoiced in hope. Saints have the same hope. I'm just giving you some reasons. You ought to hold on to your hope and keep your hope alive. Saints are bound in hope. Saints look for the object of hope. Hope is makes them not be ashamed. Hope continues to allow them to hold fast to the principles and precepts of God. Hope uh, allows us not to be moved when everything around us seems to be drifting. Hope is connected to faith and love. Hope in salvation. Hope in a new day. Hope, uh, hope in a new tomorrow. Hope in a new heaven. Hope in a new earth. Hope in righteousness. Hope in the resurrection of life. Hope in eternity eternal life and hope in glory. Hope will give you a pure life. Hope will give you an encouraged life. Hope will give you an uplifted life. Hope will improve your attitude. Hope will improve your marriage. Hope will have you going in on the job saying thank you and good morning to the same folk that tried to fire you last week. Hope tells you that even if my brother has an alt with me, I'm going to love him anyhow. Hope says that I'm going to get out here and I'm going to be a part of the evangelism team. Hope says they may not be coming back, but I'm not going to stop calling and encouraging them. Hope says I'm going to come together with the leadership. So ask them, what can I do for the Lord's church? Hope continues to allow you to look past your present and into the future because you know that as a child of God, it's time to keep your hope alive. You follow what I'm saying? have to keep your hope alive. Now listen, listen, this is a lectureship. I don't want y'all to hold it against me. But you know I like to be extemporaneous too. But when you come to a lectureship, you ought to deal with the subject. Is that all right? And listen, Jeremiah 29 literally shows us family that even though you're going through it, you're not going through it alone. Yeah. Oh, that ought to be some good news. That ought to be some good news. Because part of the battle is knowing that you're going to win in the end. The church is not going to lose. Jesus said that hell will not prevail against the church. And the reason that we ought to remain faithful in the Lord's church and to Christ is because it's a sure win in the end. Are you following what I'm saying? I say it's a sure win in the end. And so I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. I don't know, but, but maybe life has beat you down. Maybe life has beat you down. And maybe you've said, you know what? I, this church thing, I, I'm just not feeling it anymore. Amen. Just not feeling it anymore. I would have thought that surely by now, I'd be out of my predicament. I'd be out of my situation. But family, God knows why you are in what you are in. And God called us here tonight here it is, family, with reason and intentionality. There is a purpose for our assembling on tonight. And whatever you are dealing with, God has brought you here to this moment in time to remind you to keep hope alive. Amen. Can we give God glory? 
because amen amen I know it looks dark I know it looks dim I know it looks bleak I know that you are in excruciating pain over decisions but through it all I, I, I say through it all yeah we are more yeah you know it don't you we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus through means that it's a process listen life is not a snapshot it's a process are y'all with me uh, how many people remember a few years back when they uh, had these Polaroid cameras Kodak camera y'all remember that instant pictures we had about three of them at our house and sometimes I just go in there and click the button just see you know but life is not a snapshot life is more like the old school way of developing photos sometimes you got to take them and go in the dark room y'all gonna pray with me go, going in the dark room means that you have some struggle you have to use some sweat equity it's going to take a lot out of you but don't give up because God has already made the way if you'll stand to your feet right now now is the time now is the time to say yes to Jesus I don't know who you are don't know where you are maybe you're watching online and, and you and you are you're betwixt and between you're almost persuaded say I know I need to I know I need to get back involved in the church maybe this pandemic has shaken your faith maybe it has caused you to to drift away from from where you know you need to be listen we're not here to beat up on you we're here to encourage one another because we need hope right now and you can't get any hope when folk are beating you down I don't need anybody to beat me down, man. I'm already low. I need someone that's going to encourage me to continue to trust in God and watch him provide for me what I am unable to provide for myself. We're gathered here today. All of this is made possible because God dispatched hope and hope lived perfectly for us hope unstopped deaf ears caused the blind to see again hope healed the lame and forgave, man, forgave mankind for his sins and hope was not appreciated and so they mocked him they whipped him but hope took it and said not a mumbling. Hope was put up on a cross for you and for me. And the goodness of God was seen through Christ on that day. He hung his head in the locks of his shoulders. He bled. He died. They buried hope. Well, somebody ought to see where this is going. They buried hope. It was dark. It was damp. And it may have been dingy. They put hope in the ground. But any time you put a seed underground, <laughs> Come on, Dr. Gibbs. What does it do? You know it's, it's sprouting up. So when you see Jesus, you need to see hope. Watch it. Because our hope is in him. And they put him in. But he was raised again. The third day. So this means that even when you...
feel like you're buried, if your hope is in Christ, you too will rise again. Who wouldn't want to come to a Jesus like that? Come to Jesus. Perhaps you're already a part of the body of Christ, but you need to rededicate yourself. You know, you know what you need to do. I don't have to tell you. Come right now while together we sing the song of invitation. Will you come? No, not one, no, not one, none else could hear all our souls deep. Keep singing, no, not keep singing, no, not I'm telling you, Jesus, oh, I'm telling you, he will God to the day. Telling you, Jesus knows all about us. I'm telling you, He will guide till the day is done. And there's not a friend like the lonely. Keep singing, no. Let the church say amen. You know, we started tonight with Brother Amram. He got us started and he handed the baton off to Brother Tucker and he certainly brought it home. Did y'all notice that's a two-man relay? Normally it takes four men to run a relay, but we had two to run the relay and they finished the race very strong. So we appreciate Brother Tucker. And on behalf of the Eastside Church and the Texas Lectureship Committee, we have a certificate of appreciation for you, Brother Tucker. And now we'll have Brother Williams to come up and have some closing comments. So, Brother Williams. We appreciate Brother Quentin for doing an outstanding job tonight. Let's give him a hand. We appreciate our brothers. And our song leader, appreciate him as well, did an outstanding job. And uh, we thank Brother Smith Kyle for his prayer. I will not hold you long. I know that today is far spent. How many of us have been here since this morning? All right, how many of us been here since Saturday? All right, I know I'm worn out. Uh, every day, all day, I have been here. But it's a good tired. It's not a bad tired. Because it's, a, it's been a fulfilling lectureship. My heart has been, like Brother Quentin said, uh, inebriated in a good way. Uh, with the Spirit of God, not the wrong spirit. Uh, I want to just give you a glimpse of tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow morning we have our very own Brother Greg Brinkley, who will be talking on the subject faithful even when fractured and uh, we want to encourage you to please come out and hear him as he kicks it off in the morning to give us that inspirational spark as we start off the day then we'll have three workshops and um, we'll have one workshop upon this live stream I build my church <laughs> And uh, there'll be some talk about that. Uh, Brother Giles and Willie Williams, they will be talking about how best to use and to utilize uh, our live stream programs to make them work for us in a more effective way. Uh, workshop number two, Brother Leon Ivory. Uh, we know him well. He's been here several times. Uh, he will be dealing with hope for the abused. Uh, where does the church fit in as we talk about ministering to those who have been abused in different ways? And then workshop three, Dr. Gerald Lee, 
And Brother Gerald Lee will be talking uh, to leaderships, the emotional health of God's spiritual leaders, which is very, very important because, you know, if your leaders are emotionally sick and spiritually ill, then it's going to be difficult to lead the church of Christ. And so we have to make sure that we are healthy as we try to lead the people of God. And then we'll have a panel discussion at Brother uh, David Lane, Brother Gibbs, and Brother Glenn. Uh, they'll be talking about the necessity of having a ministerial succession plan and elders retiring. In other words, basically saying, at some point we all have to say, it's time to sit down and transition. And we all have to get there. We will get there. I often say, uh, if we don't move off of center stage, the stage will move us. You know, you ever been to Disney World where you get in this chair and you sit down and they kind of take you through, you know, the stage moves, you're moving. And so I've learned that all you got to do is just keep living and eventually you will be moved. Even David, that great giant killer, had to be told, David, you need to stay home. Because we can't fight the giants and for you too, to save you. So there comes a time that all of us have to understand we need to have a move out of the, out of the, out of the pathway for those who come on. And we become encouragers to them and mentors for them. And then in the afternoon, uh, Brother Gene Rowe uh, will come and he will talk about transmission of the faith in a world of relativism. So we want to have him to talk about that. And our own youth minister uh, will be talking tomorrow on TikTok time is running out. Amen. Stages for reaching Gen Z's. Uh, we want it to be very relevant, obviously. Um, then Brother Emmanuel White, uh, he will be talking to our men. You know, Brother White has a, a great program that he has been doing for years. Uh, the Brotherhood of Men that's all over, men from all over, even from other countries come. And uh, they do it annually. I've been there several times. I've presented as well as been a participant just by being in the audience. It has always been very edifying. I've never come back empty. I've always come back full. And he'll be talking the need for strong spiritual male leadership in the home. And then, of course, we'll have uh, Brother John Tillman will be our speaker at the close of the day. We'll have two, Brother T John Tillman Jr., ministering to the suffering and the grieving. And then Brother Jack Evans Jr. will talk on the subject, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. And we need to understand that. And then our night session, as we close it out for this year, We'll have Brother Ben Foster, one of the uh, pioneer preachers in this brotherhood. A whole lot of us were taught by Brother Foster at Southwestern Christian College. And he'll close us out. He and Brother Gibbs, Brother Foster will speak on the subject, no matter what, stay the course, keep on preaching. And then Brother Gibbs, what to do when you feel like quitting. I think all of those are worthy of hearing. And I know the men of God that we've selected to bring these messages that they'll do an outstanding job. Let us pray for them. And our men tonight have done just an excellent job. And uh, we appreciate them in spite of the health challenges that they were struggling under. I know uh, Brother Tucker, he has been going through something with his throat. I'm just glad that he could speak tonight. And so we are thankful that he pushed himself on through. And Brother Jonah, I am Ram. I knew him as a little guy, because he's still little in, a, in statue, but <laughs> tall in the pulpit, tall in the Lord. Amen. And that's it. But I, I remember him uh, from the days that we would go to Louisiana and Lafayette, and he would mimic preachers. And uh, now he is a preacher. 
And not just a preacher, but somebody is preaching. Very good. Thank God for them. Let us all stand at this time. And uh, Brother Lyons, would you give us our benediction, please? We're going to ask uh, Brother Tucker and Brother Joyner to go ahead and go to the foyer so that the brothers can meet you and greet you and the sisters can meet and greet you as well. You will give us our benediction and we'll be dismissed. Thank you. God bless you. See you in the morning. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your holy and divine name. We love you. We thank you for all your many wonderful blessings. Thank you for each and every blessing you bestowed upon us. And we thank you for answering each and every prayer that we've ever uttered. Heavenly Father, we come thanking you tonight for this lectureship. For those that have come and for all those that have heard that your word be proclaimed. We ask special blessings upon Brother Tucker and upon Brother Joyner. Bless them in a special way. And we thank you to fix our hearts and minds to come back and be here tomorrow to close it out. But we praise you. We honor you. We thank you. We thank you for all your many wonderful blessings. Now may the grace of God, the fellowship of, our, of your Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and, each and every one of us now and forevermore. May we all say amen. amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you.